W here is a key directed directly to this particular passage in Merchant of Venice where Francis is hiding this secret set of identifications that Janus represents Mary and Sad, Sad and Mary, Democritus and Heraclitus, Antonio and Bassanio, Francis and Anthony. And there it is, I put it next to it just so you can see it one more time. So we have, I mean this is really extraordinary, we have a passage that mentions Janus, we have the double-headed acrostic identifying it in, in the margin, and then we have an actual picture of Janus at the front of the first, first folio with the happy and, 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 and sad faces. I think that's really an extraordinary thing. All right, so let's summarise now the layers that we've, we've put together. The characters are Antonio and Bassanio. The Bacon brothers are Anthony and Francis. The philosophers are Heraclitus and Democritus, the weeping and the laughing philosopher. They also map onto the ideas of tragedy and comedy. And the whole thing is, is the archetype is two-headed Janus. Well, that's part one. So now I'd like to excavate our archaeology a little deeper and I want to actually now look at the sources from which the author of Merchant of Venice has assembled his play. Well, much work's been done on this by scholars and it turns out that the, the plot for the play is certainly taken from this book called El Pecoroni, which means the simpleton. The plot of this book is, is essentially identical to, to what lays out in Merchant of Venice. Well, there are some very, very slight changes which turn out to be very significant, but all the elements of the plot are there, of the Bond plot. It's written by a fellow called Ser Giovanni, or Per Giovanni, I may have that wrong, uh, in Italian in the 14th century, and it was published in Milan in 1558. So three years before Bacon was born, so there's no question of suggesting that Bacon wrote it. The fascinating thing about this is that while scholars absolutely are in agreement that this was the source of the plot of the play, it was written in Italian and was never translated into English at that time. So that presents a major problem for those who still believe that William Shakespeare of Stratford was the author because he certainly didn't have any Italian. And so scholars don't like to linger over this point but they suggest that perhaps there was an English translation which has now been lost. Absolute nonsense, there was no English translation. In fact, it does go one step further than that because it has been demonstrated that the author certainly was using the Italian version of, of this. You can compare words and phrases back to the Italian and from the English and you can make a compelling case that uh, the author must have had the Italian version at his elbow when he was writing it. Well, here's the frontispiece of this, uh, of this book when it came out in 1558, Il Pecoroni, printed in Milan. And just to quickly summarise the plot, it concerns the youngest of three sons, whose name was Gianetto, who was left penniless in his father's will. <laughs> he was then assisted financially by his godfather, Anselmo, who was a rich merchant in Venice. And then it all develops from there, exactly as it does in the play. Now, there's another book that, that also is very important for Merchant of Venice, and it came out in Paris in 1581. And it's this book. It's called The Epitomies, Epitomies de Sans Histoire, The Epitomies of 100 Stories by a fellow called Alexander Sylvain. Now, this is a fascinating book. What it consists of, it's exercises in oratory. And there's 100 of these exercises in oratory in this book. And in each exercise, the author has picked a, a topic or an idea from, from literature, or even a few of them are of his own invention. And He's constructed two speeches, one in favour of a proposition, the other against the proposition. And he's done this 100 times as a set of exercises for oratory. Well, the 95th exercise in this book of 100 is between the Jew and the merchant over the pound of flesh. And he has taken it from Il Pecoroni. Again, this is non-controversial. So here we are, Alexander Sylvain, published in Paris 1581 in French. Epitome 95, un juif qui pour sa dette veut un livre de la chair d'un chrétien, a pound of flesh of the Christian. And so we have the, the Jew gives his reasons for wanting the pound of flesh, the Christian says why he shouldn't have to have the pound of flesh, and then it takes three or four pages. But again, it's certainly the case that quotations and ideas from these couple of pages turn up in Merchant of Venice. 
Now, the amazing thing about this book is that it was translated into English and published in London in 1596. Extraordinary. This is the very year when Merchant of Venice was being written and someone arranged to have this book published in English and issued in London. Now, you can see here it's written in French by Alexander Sylvain and Englished by LP, which is a lovely word, Englished. Go ahead another. So we'll see this in a moment. The book was called The Orator when it was translated. And this LP stands for a fellow called Lazarus Pio. And this Lazarus Pio is known now who it was. It was a writer called Anthony Mundy, who wrote other things during that time. He was one of the kind of the, the lesser writers of the day. And he did other translations from the French also under this other pen name, Lazarus Pio. It's, it's now absolutely established. Lazarus Pio means was Anthony Mundy. So here we are, here's just uh, zooming in on, that, on that, that page, the front, written in French by Alexander Sylvain. And this is the heading from the, the English part of the, uh, the 95th Declamation. A Jew unto whom a Christian merchant owed 900 crowns would have summoned him for the same, etc., etc. And then he's demanded the pound of flesh. And it's our, it's our own familiar plot that we're used to. So we've got these three books now. We've got Il Pecoroni, written in Italian in 1558. We've got the Epitomies written in Paris in 1581 and we've got the Orator in London in 1596. So we have this kind of chain of these three texts from which Merchant of Venice has been created. Now I'm rather fascinated by this Alexander Sylvain. First of all, think about his name, Alexander Sylvain. It is a pen name. It's accepted as a pen name of a fellow called Alexander Vanden Bush. But think about this name, Alexander Sylvain. Break it down what it means. Alexander means conqueror. Sylvain means nature. So Alexander Sylvain we could decode as conqueror of nature. Now in Baconian terms, that's a very provocative kind of phrase because you could almost use that as, as the title of Bacon, conqueror of nature. That, that is what his philosophical works were all about. So let's look at the works of this Alexander Vanden Bush. Well, it becomes very curious. He was actually a soldier. He wasn't a writer at all, but he published one book in 1571 under his own name without any hint of the Alexander Sylvain and it's called Arithmetic Militaire and it's a book about how to arrange your soldiers on the battlefield correctly, geometrically for the best, uh, the best strategic advantage. He published nothing before or after that, but then in the last few years of his life, four books came out from under his pen, all with this Alexander Sylvain name. In 1576, there was a book called Poems and Anagrams. It contains delightful poems and anagrams about all the people at Henry III's court. In 1579, he brings out a book of 55 of these oratorical exercises, which he expands and in 1581 publishes as the full 100 exercises. And then in 1582, he produces a book called Cinquante Enigmes Francais, 50 French enigmas, which are 50 kind of puzzles, if you like, clever literary puzzles that uh, he then explains what they mean. And then at the end of the book, he just tosses in a few extra puzzles in Spanish. Well, let's have a quick look at those books. Here we have The, the Arithmetic Militaire by Vanden Bush. No trace of Sylvain's name on it. Here's a couple of random pages from it. As you can see, they, these are how to lay out your troops in the right geometrical and mathematical way. And now we have the Sylvain works. Here is the 1576, the anagrams. And here is an example from this anagrams book. So he's written, here's one of the pages. This is a poem that he's written about Henry de Valois. And he's used the first letter of each line to spell out Henri de Valois as an acrostic. So this book is, every, every poem in the book does that. It picks a person and then it writes their name down the side. Then it composes a delightful a poem about their name. So it's obviously someone who's very clever with courtly wit. Here we have the 55 histories and then here we have the epitomies with the full 100 histories coming out in 1579 and 81, both under the name Sylvain. And then here we have the 1582 book, the, the Enigmas, again under the name of Sylvain, somewhere there, up there, Alexandra Sylvain. Okay, so let's just now, side by side, compare the works of Alexander Sylvain 
and the movements of Francis Bacon at the time. In 1576, out comes the first version. That's the year that, Par that Francis arrives at the court. In 1579, he brings out the 55 stories. Well, that's the last year he's there. Then Francis goes back to England. So he comes back for 1581, 1582. He does a tour of France, Italy and Spain, as we've seen. In 1581, this Alexander Sylvain brings out his Epitomies book. Then in 1582, he brings out the French Enigmas with a couple of Spanish ones added in. Well, you know, when I first started looking at this, I thought, you know, I want to believe that Alexander Sylvain is a pen name of Francis, but could it possibly be? Could it, come on, could it, could it really be? Could Francis as a young man, as a, as a teenager, have been writing these books under a pen name in France? Well, I couldn't really let myself believe that until I discovered this. This is the dedication to the English version, the orator, that came out in 1596. It's dedicated to Lord John, Lord St. John Baron of Blesto. Now this is certain, and it's signed, as you can see, by Lazarus Pio at the end. Now this is certainly not the dedication from the 1581 book in French. And we can be certain of that first because it is signed by the translator, Lazarus Pio, but it's addressed to Lord St. John, who was a real person in England at that time. And it's also very different from the dedication of the 1581 book. So there's no question about it. This is a fresh dedication written in 1596, ostensibly by the translator. But there's something very fascinating in here that I want to zero in on, and I've enlarged it here. The translator says of this book, describing it, having hewn out of my rough wit this first fruit of mine oratory. What an extraordinary thing. This is the translator. This is not the first fruit of the translator's oratory. It's the translator. But that's clearly what he's saying. This Lazarus Pio is claiming that the book that follows was the first fruit of his oratory. Well, how extraordinary. If we go to Lazar Lazarus Pio's other books that he translated and we look at the dedication in them, it's clear in those ones that he knows what's going on. He describes himself as the translator. He protests that he's not a scholar. He says he's done the best job that he can with the author's work. But in this particular book, he throws all that overboard and he's actually claiming to have written the original. So let's cut to the chase. This, this is what happened. In 1581, Francis went to Italy and there he read Il Pecoroni in the Italian, which he was fluent in. It inspired him to write the 95th exercise in his book, The Epitomies, which he published in French in Paris under the name Alexander Sylvain. Then in 1596, he arranged for this book to be translated into English by Anthony Mundy, who he, who he worked with, under the translation name Lazarus Pio, and it was published as the orator. But Bacon himself wrote the dedication, signing it Lazarus Pio, taking credit for the original Epitomies of 1581. And then, at that time, he used this set of books as the basis for Merchant of Venice. Without going into too much detail, this one is so fascinating that, that I can't help myself th that share it with you. So what I want to demonstrate by this is that the author of Merchant of Venice had all these original texts beside him, the Italian and the French. If you look at the first one, Epitomies 1581, Le juge ordinaire ordonne que le juif coupera justement un livre de la chair. The ordinary judge of the place ordered that the Jew would cut just a pound of flesh. But you can see there, even if you can't read French, you can see that justement applies to coupera. Justement there is an adverb. Now when it gets translated by Anthony Mundy in 1596, this is the way it comes out. The ordinary judge of the place appointed him to cut off a just pound of the Christian flesh. And if he cut more or less than a pound. So in this case, the word just has shown up again, but in this case it's not an adverb, it's qualifying pound, so it's an adjective. Now let's turn to Merchant of Venice. In Merchant of Venice, in the crucial trial scene, Portia says, Shed then no blood, nor cut thou less or more, but just a pound of flesh. If thou cuts more or less than a just pound. Now look what's going on there. This just is correctly an adverb because it's qualifying cut, but this just is qualifying pound and it's an adjective. So Francis, writing Merchant of Venice, 
has noticed that, Alexander, uh, that Anthony Mundy kind of got it a little bit wrong with that word and he can't help himself but correct it but he's also nodding to the orator by adding it as well. So the word just is put in twice, once as an adjective, once as, as an adverb. It's like he's leaving us a trail of breadcrumbs through these texts. Here's a lovely line from uh, midway through the, the play from Merchant of Venice. Nerissa says to Portia, what say you then to Falconbridge, the young baron of England? And he's one of the suitors. And Portia says, you know I say nothing to him, for he understands not me, nor I him. He hath neither Latin, French, or Italian. In other words, Portia's saying, the only suitable suitor for me is someone who could speak Latin, French, and Italian. And this is Bassanio, of course, who is Francis. And so again, we've got a little trail of breadcrumbs here telling us that uh, Bassanio could speak Latin, French, or Italian as could, as could Francis. One aspect is the merry aspect of the bond. And in fact, this pound of flesh story actually goes way back in history. There are many, many, many sources of this pound of flesh, going right back to the Mahabharata. It's kind of a deep story of humanity, this idea of borrowing money and this pound of flesh. But in none of these sources, except Shakespeare, is the bond described as a merry bond. It's unique to Shakespeare that the bond is merry, mixing jest with earnest, the pound of bacon. Food and dining as the key metaphor of the play. This doesn't occur in Il Pecoroni or the Orator or any of this. And I mentioned before that some of the details are tweaked in Merchant of Venice. In Il Pecoroni, it's not Bassanio taking out the loan. In Il Pecoroni, Antonio takes out the loan and he freely gives the money to Bassanio. But in Merchant of Venice, it's subtly and specifically different. It's Bassanio taking out the loan and Antonio standing bond for it. In other words, the author has changed the details and in this case they have been changed so that they precisely match the biographical details <coughs> of Francis and Anthony. And I think that's, that's very telling. Well, that's the sources for the pound of flesh. Now I want to talk about the sources for the Heraclitus and Democritus. This is really extraordinary. This is a poem called A Dialogue Upon the Troubles Past Between Heraclitus and Democritus, the Weeping and the Laughing Philosophers, published in the English in 1599, and I hope you're keeping track of the dates here. It's included in a book called The Miracle of the Peace in France, celebrated by the ghost of the divine Dubartus, translated by Joshua Sylvester, and there it is, 1599. This is all fascinating, but we're not going to go into that. We want to focus on this poem, The Dialogues Past Between Heraclitus and, and Democritus. So there's just a summary of information. Now the first thing about this book is that it's dedicated to Anthony Bacon. It's dedicated to Anthony Bacon. Here's the dedication to the most honourable, learned and religious gent, Mr Anthony Bacon. In the second edition of this book, it was published as part of a complete works in 1605. Here is the dedication again to Anthony Bacon. And you can see that at the top of the page is the famous Archer device, printing device, which appears on the first folio and Bacon's works, and the King James Bible, and some, some of these other key works of the day. So this particular translation from the French of this particular book, dedicated to Anthony Bacon and printed under the Shakespeare printing device. Now, in this poem occurs this extraordinary uh, line from Democritus. It's, it's a dialogue, they have, they have verses with each other. And Democritus says to Heraclitus, Ha! Huh, but why weeps thou? Wherefore in this sort does thou lament, lament amid this merry sport? There's the exact phrase, merry sport, turning up in this 1599 book. Remember, the play was finished in 1598. Now this is the only occasion in the entire works of Shakespeare where that phrase occurs, merry sport. He uses the word merry, he uses the word sport, but he never uses merry sport together except in The Merchant of Venice. And here it is turning up in this poem that apparently comes out the following year. But there's also a very, another very, very remarkable phrase in this poem. Democritus says, I take the world to be but as a stage where net masked men do play their personage. In Merchant of Venice, Antonio says, I hold the world but as the world, Bracciano, a stage where every man must play his part and mine a sad one. One of the most famous ideas from Shakespeare and yet, here it is turning up in this play, in this poem of 1599. 
It also turns up in As You Like It. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. Perhaps the most famous line in all of Shakespeare. Funnily enough, it also turns up in Francis Bacon's Device for Essex, 1595, while your life is nothing but a continual acting upon a stage. So there's a real mystery here. It's clear that either the play has borrowed from the poem or the poem has borrowed from the play, one or the other. But both of them are in a sense impossible. Let's first of all work out if the play could have borrowed from the poem. Well, it couldn't because the play was finished in 1598 and the poem wasn't published until 1599. It was published in French in 1598, but that would mean, well, the, the poem came after the play. So the author of the play couldn't have been borrowing from the poem, but could it have been the other way around? Well, that's impossible either. The, that would mean that the author of the poem saw the play performed in London, raced back to Paris, remembered a couple of the lines, but it's ridiculous. So whichever way you look at it, it doesn't seem possible. And I suggest that the answer to this conundrum is that the author of the play must have had an unpublished version of this poem at his elbow when he was writing the play. So here we have an absolutely fascinating poem which includes several key phrases from Merchant of Venice in the context of a dialogue between Heraclitus and Democritus something that has never before today been identified with Merchant of Venice. And in this book is dedicated to Anthony Bacon and printed under the printing device of the first folio. Absolutely extraordinary. And there's one other absolutely amazing line in this poem. I laugh to see how fortune, like a ball, plays with the globe of this inconstant all. How she degrades these and graces those, how whom some whom she lifts up, down again she throws. So I've highlighted the two words there, fortune and globe, both of which have been capitalised. Now they're very provocative words because of course they remind us of the theatres, the fortune theatre and the globe theatre. Now let's just refresh ourselves on Elizabethan theatre history. Here's a lovely map of London taken from Google Earth. In 1598, the two main playhouses were the theatre and the rose down here. And Shakespeare's troupe played here and the other troupe played here. Now it was a very famous event at the end of 1598. There was all kinds of uh, behind the scenes problems with ownership of the land and so forth. And what they decided to do to cut through all the clutter, they simply demolished the theatre. They took it apart beam by beam and they walked it down across the Thames and rebuilt the theatre as the globe in 1599. Well this meant that they were just around the corner from the rows, which was no good for the other players, so they formed themselves a new theatre up there called The Fortune, which was built in 1599-1600. So how extraordinary that this poem, written in 1598 and appearing in London in 1599, should just happen to predict, as it were, the names of the two theatres, The Fortune and The Globe. There's quite a mystery there. We could go on with that later, but I'll keep going. All right, well, we're still talking about the sources for Heraclitus and Democritus. Now, as I was working through all this material and discovering this and getting quite excited, I realised one day that there was one thing I was missing in this lovely set of proofs. What I was missing was Francis Bacon himself identifying himself as Democritus. This was the key. I could see that Francis was associated with Bassanio. I could see Bassanio was associated with Democritus. But what I needed to close the gap was Francis himself declaring that he is Democritus. Well, here's the letter, the famous letter for Baconians that Francis Bacon wrote to Lord Burley in 1592. Now, the context of this letter is that he'd been trying to get a position, a paid position from the Queen that would enable him to write freely. He just wanted an income so he could write. I know the feeling. But they, wouldn't, they wouldn't go, weren't going to have a bar of it. They weren't giving him any money, so he was obliged to keep borrowing from these fellows like Giles Simpson. Well, in 1592, Francis was getting really sick of this situation. He wrote one more letter to try and convince them to do this. And, the, and in this part of the letter, he's saying what he will do if they don't agree to give him his suit. He says, this is what I'll do. I'll sell the inheritance that I have, and I'll purchase some lease of quick revenue or some office of gain that shall be executed by deputy, and so give over all care of service, 
and become some sorry bookmaker or a true pioneer in that mine of truth which he said lay so deep. Well, who said? Who said lay so deep? Doesn't tell us. Leaves it hanging. Read that a thousand times and it won't help you. So who actually said this? Who, who, who talked about a true pioneer in that mine of truth? How could we find out where this came from? Well, fortunately, Francis clears it up for us. This is in the Advancement of Learning, 1605. He answers the riddle. And I quote, Here We will now proceed to natural philosophy. If then it be true that Democritus said that the truth of nature lies hid in certain deep mines and caves. So there we are. Francis is identifying that it was Democritus who said that. Let's just go back to the letter. I'll become some sorry bookmaker or a true pioneer in that mine of truth, which he said lay so deep. Democritus said the truth of nature lies hidden in certain deep mines and caves. Well, Francis goes on. If that's the case, he said, that Democritus said that, then, then it would be good to divide natural, natural philosophy into the mine and the furnace and to make two professions or occupations of natural philosophers, some to be pioneers and some smiths, some to dig and some to refine. In other words, Democritus said that truth requires digging to get to, that truth is buried down in the layers, that to get to truth, we have to dig down into the depths and bring it up. But furthermore, the digging up, it up is only half the job. Then we have to do something with what we've dug up. We have to smelt it, we have to turn it into the goods that make up the world. So Francis is saying here that there's essentially two valid courses of action for philosophers. You can either be a pioneer or you can be a smith. And this is what Francis was saying to Lord Burley. He was saying, I'll become some sorry bookmaker or a true pioneer in that mine of truth. In other words, Francis was saying, I will follow after Democritus. My career will be a Democritian career in philosophy. So here's Francis identifying himself at the beginning of his career with Democritus. Well, in fact, this particular quote comes from a very particular book of Democritus. Well, it's not a Democritus. We don't have any of his books. It comes from Diogenes Laertius' The Lives of the Eminent Philosophers, which is a book which discusses biographies of the philosophers who have come before. And in this book from Diogenes Laertius' Lives of the Philosophers, he tells us about Democritus. Well, it turns out that Democritus is the youngest of three sons. He had inheritance issues. He was ripped off by his brothers. And he spent all his money on travelling around to educate himself. He took all of knowledge to be his province. He decided that he was going to become an expert on absolutely everything, which might remind you of something, someone. He didn't care about fame. It was said of him that he never went to Athens. In other words, he didn't care about going to Athens and making a name for himself. He wandered around the countryside philosophising and he would laugh at every situation. So, what we can... This is like 300 BC or something like that. So one can well imagine now Francis reading Diogenes Laertius, and we know he read it because he quotes him, and he reading that Democritus was the youngest of three sons, that he spent all his money, that he took all knowledge to be his province, that he laughed at every situation. We can well imagine Francis saying, I am Democritus. But wouldn't it be nice to have one extra thing that really nails it down? Well, here it is. This is actually from the book, Diogenes Laertius, the English translation, talking about Democritus. The same authority states that when he returned from his travels, he was reduced to a humble mode of life because he'd exhausted his means. And because of his poverty, he was supported by his brother, Demasis. So how do you like that? Democritus was borrowing money from his brother. So now we're able to really lay out these layers. In The Merchant of Venice, we have Antonio and Bassanio. In Il Pecoroni, they correspond to Ansaldo and Gianetto. They correspond to the Bacon brothers, Anthony and Francis. They correspond to the philosophers Heraclitus and Democritus, 
who didn't live together, but they've been lumped together in the history of philosophy. But they also correspond to Democritus' own biography and life, Demasus, his brother, and Democritus. And so in all these different situations, these fictional and biographical situations, we have a pair of brothers where the youngest one lost out in his inheritance, devoted himself to writing, and was supporting himself by borrowing from his brother. <laughs> yeah, it's extraordinary. <laughs> well, we're nearly at the end, but I guess we do have to show that Francis Bacon did write Merchant of Venice. <laughs> so let's have a couple of uh, parallels between Francis's own works and Merchant of Venice. This one's just gold. In his Promus notebook, which was Francis's notebook of, 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 of things that he collected, common sayings and so forth that he collected to use, it's definitely written by 1595. The book is finished by 1595. And in it one can find the phrase, all is not gold that glisters. Well, in The Merchant of Venice, when one of the suitors comes in and he looks at the gold casket, he says, all that glisters is not gold. Now, that's actually a phrase that has turned up in many places from Chaucer. Chaucer uses it all the way through. But in every other single occasion in literature where it's used, the word is glitters. All that glitters is not gold. The only writer who uses the phrase glisters is Shakespeare. And yet, two years before the play was written, there it is in Francis' notebook, glisters. Now this one uh, is a little bit lengthy, but it's just so beautiful that stick with me if, if, if I haven't exhausted your patience. This one's worth it. In the final act of Merchant of Venice, the following exchange takes place between Portia and Nerissa. Portia says, that light we see is burning in my hall. How far that little candle throws his beams. So shines a good deed in a naughty world. Nerissa says, when the moon shone, we did not see the candle. And Portia says, so doth the greater glory dim the less. A substitute shines brightly as a king until a king be by, and then his state empties itself as does an inland brook into the main of waters. So you can see the metaphor that Francis is, is making here. A candle is very, very bright, but when the moon comes out, all of a sudden the moon is much brighter than the candle. Well, that's just as if a substitute is standing in for the king, where the substitute seems to be very grand, but when the king comes back, the substitute is nothing. It's also like a river. A river seems terrific. Look at that mighty river. But when it empties into the sea, you realise it's nothing. So we've got a triple conjunction of metaphors here. The candle and the moon, the substitute and the king, the river falling into the, the main. Now here's a quote from Francis Bacon's A Brief Discourse Touching the Happy Union of the Kingdom of England and Scotland. This was a letter, as it were, that he wrote to King James talking about the implications of Scotland joining with England, which is the lesser joining with the greater. And he says, He's talking about the conditions under which the lesser joins with the greater. Scotland, the lesser, joining with England, the greater. He says, the second condition is that the greater draws the less. So we see, when two lights do meet, the greater doth darken and drown the less. And when a small river runs into a greater, it loses both the name and the stream. So there we have the, ex the exact triple conjunction of ideas as occurs in Merchant of Venice. Well, you might say, ah, but it's 1603. This is five years later. Perhaps Francis read The Merchant of Venice, stole the idea and put that in. Well, OK. And, but before we get to that, here's the front page of the brief discourse of the happy union of the kingdom of England and Scotland. And I think the first line is very interesting. I do find it strange, excellent king, that when Heraclitus, he that was surnamed the Obscure, had set forth a certain book which is now not extant, many men took it for a discourse of nature. In other words, Francis dares to bring up the name Heraclitus in the context of this uh, work where he's dropping parallels to the Merchant of Venice. As I say, it's almost as if there's a trail of breadcrumbs. But did he copy the Merchant of Venice? Well, actually, no, he didn't. Because Francis was also responsible for this Gesta Graeorum, 1594, which was the account of the revels at Gray's Inn. And it's accepted by orthodox scholars that, that, that Francis wrote this. And in this book, 1594, two years before Merchant, but now our principality is determined, which although it shines very bright in ours and others' darkness, yet at the royal presence of Her Majesty, it appears as, as an obscure shadow. In this, not unlike the morning star, which looks very cheerfully in the world, so long as the sun looks not on it, 
or as the great rivers that triumph in the multitude of their waters until they come to the sea. The same triple parallel before, during and after. Well, we're nearly at the end now. A couple of quick more ones. Remember back to Falstaff in Henry IV Part II, how we showed that was connected to the arrest. Well, it also turns out that Henry IV also connects up to the orator, the speech of the Jew. And there's a very fascinating parallel here. Falstaff splutters at one point in Henry IV Part II. I can get no remedy against this consumption of the purse. Borrowing only lingers and lingers it out. But the disease is incurable the disease of the consumption of the purse, not having enough money. Or the Jew in the orator, when he's asked why he wants the pound of flesh, he says, and again, he doesn't give a good reason, but he's giving a few reasons that he could give if he felt like giving reasons. I might also say that I have need of this flesh to cure a friend of mine of a certain malady, which is otherwise incurable. So it's almost as if we have these hidden links going on between these different works and different plays, invisible behind-the-scenes links that, that Francis is showing us. At the end of Henry IV, there's an epilogue where the author steps onto the stage and gives a speech at the end of the play. This is it as it appears in the first folio. There's the Archer device at the top again. And I want to highlight something that happens in the middle here. And this is the author of the play, obviously played by an actor, and the speech that he's making is he's kind of saying this. He's saying, previously I've promised you another play after, after Henry IV Part One. He says, I promised you another play. Well, this is it. And I'm hoping that, that, that I've fulfilled my promise to you or my debt to you. So he, this is what he says. I was lately here in the end of a displeasing play to pray your patience for it and to promise you a better. I did mean indeed to pay you with this, which if like an ill venture it come unluckily home, I break and you, my gentle creditors, lose. Here I promised you I would be, and here I commit my body to your mercies. Bait me some, I'll pay you some, as most debtors do, promise you infinitely. What does this mean? Like an ill venture, it come unluckily home. An ill venture is a ship that's been sent off to do business and to come back. That's exactly what happens in Merchant of Venice. This is why Antonio lost the bond, because his ships, his ill ventures, came not luckily home. And now here we have the author standing up and saying, oh, well, don't worry about that. I said I'd pay you. I couldn't. So here I commit my body to your mercies, my pound of flesh to your mercies. So here we have another link between Henry IV and Merchant of Venice and more of these breadcrumbs that, that Francis has been dropping along the way. Well, we're nearly there now, but we've still got one or two questions to answer. How did Bassanio run up his debts? He doesn't tell us at the start of the play, but we know he's already been borrowing from Antonio, but the purpose is unclear. This is the, uh, the line. It is not unknown to you, Antonio, how much I have disabled mine estate by something showing a more swelling port than my faint means would grant continuance. So Bassanio is saying, okay, you know I've been borrowing money for something. I'm just going to refer to it as a swelling port. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, a swelling is a very Baconian and a very Shakespearean word, which is often applied to water. A swelling port is a port where the tide has come in, which means when the tide comes in, it means boats can sail in and out. So by swelling port, he's referring to sending ships out into the world. But Bassanio wasn't sending any ships out into the world. So what's he talking about? Well, without getting into whether or not Bacon wrote this book, Aristotle's Politic. Let's just pull out this phrase from it. The fortune of books published resembles that of ships at sea. And this was an idea that Bacon came back to over and over, that books going out into the world are like ships going out on the ocean. Books take ideas around the world, just like ships take commodities around the world. This was actually a central motif of Bacon's work. Here we are in advancement of learning. If therefore the invention of the ship was thought so noble, which carries commodities from place to place and consociateth the remotest regions in participation of their fruits, how much more are letters or books to be valued, which like ships pass through the vast ocean of time and convey knowledge and inventions to the remotest age. And here is the cover of the advancement of learning and here's the ship passing out through the pillars of Hercules, which is representing Bacon's books going out. So what he's telling us is that Bassanio's Money had been spent not on ships, but ships are books on books, that he became a sorry bookmaker. So 
we really have a series of displacements in operation here. Books are boats. London is Venice. Lombards and foreigners are Jews. Giles Simpson is Shylock and Francis and Anthony are Bassanio and Antonio. This was Francis' way of dealing with some very provocative political ideas in the context of the 1590s where there were riots over Dutch traders who'd come in. This was his way of dealing with a very difficult political subject without raising the ire of the authorities by substituting and displacing all these issues across to Venice. Well, we're nearly there now. I mentioned the emblem books early on and I showed you the picture of Heraclitus and Democritus. Well, these emblem books were very popular in this time. They went through a, a hundred editions and everyone used them and loved them. And they consist of all these interesting enigmatic pictures with a poem. And this is one of the famous ones. And it's a bit hard to see in this version I've shown you, but you might be able to see. Here is a winged figure and he's got an hourglass here somewhere and he's pulling a, a, a naked woman out from a cave. And it's, and it's headed, Veritas Filia Temporis, Truth, the Daughter of Time. And this appears in one of the most famous of the emblem books, Emblemata 1595, Adriana Tunis. Well, well, what does this mean? Well, fortunately, the author tells us. So this is now the quote from the book. He tells us what this emblem means. He says, the saying of the old poet is on everyone's lips, truth is the daughter of time. Because evidently time brings truth to light, and Saturn is without doubt to be regarded as time. Now certainly, he goes on, it is well known that Democritus said that truth was once buried and lay hidden in a very deep well, from which comes the reason for devising this emblem. Truth should then be represented as a naked young woman emerging from the navel up out of a dark cave among rocks, whom Saturn, flying in the air, leads out by the right hand. So Junius was telling us that this image is the end product of the Democritean philosophy, that truth is hidden in the deep mines and the dark caves of the earth. We need to dig it out. That takes time. So eventually time brings truth, personified as the woman, out of the caves of the earth. Published posthumously the year or two after Francis died, his final work of his life, The New Atlantis, a work unfinished. And it has this fascinating emblem on the front cover. A bit hard to see, so I've blown it up for you. And as you can see, we have a winged figure with an hourglass helping a naked woman out of a cave. And around we have tempor patet occulta veritas. Time brings forth hidden truth. So Francis has on his final work stamped the front of the work with an emblem which represents the final stage of the Democritean philosophical process of bringing truth to light out of the deep, dark caves of the earth. So he stamped the beginning of his career with the letter to Burley by declaring that he was going to work in Democritus' ideals. And he stamped the end of his work by showing that he had succeeded and he, he was bringing truth out of the caves. Extraordinary. So Francis did very much associate himself with Democritus. And this is why he's overlaid Democritus <laughs> and Heraclitus over the characters of Bassanio and Antonio in the play. <coughs> well, this is from Francis's notebook. To give authors their due as you give time his due, which is to discover truth, which he explains in Advancement of Learning. Let great authors have their due as time which is the author of authors, be not deprived of his due, which is further and further to discover truth. And there it is. Francis should have his due now in time because time has brought forth the truth. So really that just leaves one question that we didn't answer. When shall we laugh? Say when. Well, the answer is today, 400 years later, we finally cracked the joke at the heart of Merchant of Venice. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask any questions or have any comments? So, Simon, thank you for a splendid talk. Thank you, Susan.
and so well researched. Thanks Thank so you much. very much for sharing your new new research with us. So, because of the time constraints, we've got to, we could have a few brief questions, and they must be relevant to the talk. Thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Um, and I'm sorry I have to go, but I've booked a car and I can't <laughs> delay. And but thank you very much indeed. And Mary is our vice president. <laughs> and Mary's mother worked um, for the Francis Bacon Society yes. as well. Yes. Thank she you, She started in uh, 1956. Yeah, I mean, that was excellent, Simon, as, Thanks, as Simon. I said. And, and I'm fairly new to the whole Bacon and Shakespeare kind of area anyway. I mean, five years is not a long time, you know, compared to people who've been devoting their lives to... To this, but um, as a, first, an observation. It's interesting when you say that um, often people who are in this, this position of kind of like academic authority, um, something will be written, and then that just becomes like the truth cast in stone, and it mm. almost becomes undiscussable and unquestionable, and, and, and so forth. So, it's very refreshing, I think, to see that these questions are now really being asked. You know, people are digging for the truth. And I think, uh, if I picked it up right, I, I really resonate with this, the democritus bit about, you've got to have this sense of humour about it yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, and take it lightly. You know, you said, yeah. I had this thought. And I, I go through similar kind of things. And, you know, I'm, I'm no academic. And, and I respect academics, but we do our different things in, in different ways. But my question would be, in terms of the acrostics and the ciphers, I mean, again, there's been so much, quotes, debunking right. of all this. And you, you came up with a very simple one there. Um, so my question would be, um, how far have you gone into the kind of deciphering of the works, um, maybe generally? Um, and, wh and what's your kind of thoughts on, on these deep hidden codes? Well, I, I mean, I believe there are a lot of deep... And, and layers as well. It's interesting to use the words lay, you know, layers. That yeah. as you strip one layer away, you're into a deeper layer, and, and what have you. But what you know, what are your thoughts about the encryption and the decryption and the coding and the decoding and that whole process? Um, well, I, is that a bit of a wide question? I, I, I think I can. I think I can attack it. Um, well, I think as you say, there's layers. I think it begins with 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 some very simple de deciphering's that, that don't really require any de like like we saw there. And it and it's by no means the only. I mean, what I like about the acrostics is first of all, it's by no means the only e example. There's there's a perfect F Bacon acrostic on the first full page of text in the in the, in the first folio, and there's others as well. Um, well, you might say, well, maybe that's just random letters and, and, and words coming together, but. The fact is the Elizabethans loved these acrostics, as, as you saw in the one that I showed. So that was very much a, 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 a factor in, in, in their poetry in that day. So in that case, given that they played with acrostics, given these acrostics are present, that seems to me very sort of low objection levels. It's what happened to the Baconian movement, as we all know, 100 years ago. It, there was a rush of blood to the head and, and the whole thing ended up sort of self-imploding. But, but in, in many ways, it's. Francis is, is the one responsible for that because he, he was fascinated by codes and ciphers and, and he spe speaks specifically about that. So it's, uh, it's not at all out of the question that, that we should you know, expect to be able to find these there. Uh, and I'm sure as time goes on, we will find codes that are, that are absolutely undeniable. But I think at this phase in the Baconian movement, uh, it's good to kind of hold back a little from those and really make the foundation so solid that now there's no question that Francis wrote it and then from there to discover the, the codes rather than to come in fr from the angle of the codes. Because for people outside, you know, the, the world that we're trying to convince here, you know, it seems like we've all lost our collective minds. And uh, so I think the codes are there but I think we have to be very, very careful how much weight we put on those. And I would rather put no, almost no weight on them and use them, once the case has already been established, use them to, to show that they're marks of authenticity rather than proofs that can, be, can carry the full burden and weight of, of the proof. So I'm fascinated by them, but I hesitate to sort of make too much of them without the, the foundations. That was just so mind-bogglingly wonderful and so the much. research is just like, I can't believe it. I'd love to know where you found it all and how many centuries it took you to do it. But anyway. <laughs> well, let me just comment on that because it's really been in two bursts, this work. It was ten years ago that I had the, the pound of bacon idea, which then, once, it, like I say, once it had gone into my head, I couldn't get it out of my head. But ten years ago, 
none of these books were, were digitized and online. Now I've come back 10 years later to do it and now all these books that I've shown you today are all fully digitized, fully online and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So any of these obscure works from the 1500s, there it is, you can just bring it up and you can read it so without even having to get out of my couch, I can, I can be finding all these yeah, things. <laughs> well, I've just followed my nose. <laughs> Who else but us is hearing what you're saying? Nobody, yet. Well, well how is this going to get out? If, if it's well, just it's going to be on YouTube, uh, oh, uh, and, okay. uh, well, and then I'll write the book, and, and a publisher will step forward, and yeah, and then it'll all go viral. And uh, yeah. <laughs> do you have plans to write a book? I'd love to write a book, yes. I'd love to write many books. I'd love to be a sorry bookmaker working in the minds of truth, a pioneer. <laughs> well, I feel what you've told us today, really, we could have done with a one-day workshop. Well, and I, yeah. I tell you, I've, I've had to cut it, cut it, cut it, you know, over and over and over. There's so much more to, that, 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 that leads on from all well, this. Well, I wish so. the Society would arrange a one-day workshop and get you back down here and try and get a bigger hall and a bigger audience. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome that. I'd and certainly follow-ups anyway. Um, you know, well, the last time you came was how many years ago? It was six? five or six years yeah. ago. Yeah. We need you back more often. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. So you. Much. I really enjoyed thank it. You thank you so much. Um, Lazarus. Yes, Lazarus. Uh, is that true? That's the truth. Uh, it is Anthony Mundy. As far as Scott, yes, there's, there's, there are some dissenting opinions, but he publishes a bunch of other books called Amadis de Gaulle, or he translates Amadis, Amadis de, Gaulle. de Gaulle, which were they were like a chivalric romances, if you like. They were kind of the precursor to Don Quixote in a way. They were very, very popular at the time in French, and. They appeared in English in the early 1590s, translated by Lazarus Pio. Well, then they appear again in the 1618, another edition of all these appears, again by Lazarus Pio, but this time Anthony Mundy takes credit for them. And so there's no question that, that in, at least in regard to these Amadis de Gaulle books, uh, they, it, it was Anthony Mundy. So that seems uncontroversial. Right. And there are other links between Mundy and Shakespeare and Mundy and Well, Bacon. absolutely, I was going to say, I mean, we, we know that Monday was very much involved with the creation of Shakespeare. Well, that's right. The Sir Thomas More play is, is the classic one where there's these three pages in, in Shakespeare's hand, in Shakespeare's ideas, and guess what? It's Francis Bacon's handwriting. <coughs> and Anthony Mundy was the main writer of that play, and then these other collaborators, including you know, Shakespeare. And you know, that's a talk for another day, but yeah, um, that's absolutely. something I actually you know, would have loved to really go into because that talks about the same issues. And, the thing about that play was it, it was it was banned. They wrote the play and then they wouldn't permit it to be performed because it was it was way too controversial because it, it was about London and it was about the riots. You don't mean the other no, no, I'm talking about uh, it's called the Book of Sir Thomas More. Oh. It was never never performed and it, it ended up turning up as a, it's one of the few manuscripts of plays that have ever been found, and it's famous because there's three pages of it which orthodoxy accepts was written by Shakespeare because of the content of these three pages. First of all, it's superb. Secondly, it's full of uh, allusions that, that show up in other Shakespeare plays. But there's also Baconian, direct Baconian parallels, parallels in there which are extraordinary. And it is in the handwriting of Bacon. And, and this is something that hasn't been done yet. But in fact, I've corresponded with Maureen Ward Gandy, who is a leading handwriting, criminal handwriting analyst in, in, in England. And she has given her preliminary opinion that it is indeed Francis Bacon's handwriting on these three pages. So there's a wonderful story to be told there. But there's the link between Anthony Mundy and Bacon at that time. Um, so they were clearly working together. And in fact, in, in, in these other works of Mundy, he makes some fascinating comments in the introduction. He says, I was, I was forced to do this uh, by, by someone who I'm under authority to, or, or words to that effect. And he makes several comments about this, that, that he's, he's doing it not because he wants to do, but because there's someone who tells him what to do who told him to translate these works. And that's Bacon. And that's Bacon. And, and then hence Lazarus Pio and the 1596 book coming out smack at that, at that time. Can one get it? Oh. The, which, which one? The, the, the Lazarus book. Yes, I mean, Google them all and you'll find, yeah. you'll find, you'll find them all. They're all there. Yep. And another question. Why did you choose the Merchant? Well, I, you know, it's, I didn't actually. It's a funny thing because, you know, I'd have to say in a funny way that it's not actually even really my favourite play, but by any means. Um, I mean, I enjoy it, I like it. It always leaves me with a slightly queasy feeling in my stomach at the end of the play with the way Shylock's treat and everything. But if I had to name, you know, my five favourite Bacon Shakespeare plays, it probably wouldn't be in there. But 
for whatever reason, like I say, one day I, I, I sort of sensed this Francis and Anthony thing and once this pound of bacon idea had occurred to me, there was just no going back. It was just, I couldn't unthink the idea because, you know, if this was occurring to these, to these guys in their real life, their names were bacon, they were borrowing money, they knew about the pound of flesh, it's inevitable. They thought of the joke and the joke, they don't have to overlay anything. It's already there in the biography, so there's no real escaping it. I mean, they must have been just slapping their thighs, the two of them, and, you know, and just... I'm sorry? Well, I, I, I have, I, you know, yes, I, you know, this, yes, I, I, I'm, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs>